favor of sanctions. A minister said such measures would hurt black people and delay reforms. The Senate vote was overwhelming, 84, four sanctions, 14 against. The bill calls for bans on investment, selected imports and airline services. <laughs>
Here's the news this morning. A bomb disposal team in West Sussex expect to work through the morning to make safe a wartime mine on a disused aerodrome near Arundel. The pipe mine was discovered buried in a field on Ford Aerodrome yesterday. Fourteen families living nearby were forced to leave their homes and were given temporary shelter at Ford Prison nearby. Exhibitors at a big conference starting in Brighton today have asked the organisers not to hold the event in the town again. Some of those at the Broadcasting Equipment Conference say the town doesn't have enough good hotel rooms. They've also complained about difficulty in parking and they say they'd like future conference conferences to be held at Dallas in the United States. The conference organisers say they're happy with the facilities Brighton can offer. Supporters of Worthing Football Club will be able to question directors about the club's troubles at a public meeting this evening. The club is £80,000 in debt. Home games are being played at Bognor because the Worthing ground still hasn't been granted a safety certificate. Cricket News and Imran Khan meets the Sussex chairman and secretary this morning to discuss his future with the club. Imran is due to fly home to Pakistan to prepare for the test series against the West Indies. Sussex have awarded him a benefit next season, but he'll be on tour in England in 1987 with Pakistan. Imran's present contract at his request allows only for a third of Sussex's three-day matches and all one-day competitions. Straight on to travel news now. If you haven't run into it yet, that work on the A24 near Ashington is still causing problems for motorists in Sussex. Seems you can't go anywhere on the M4 without bumping into roadworks. There are lane closures in both directions, still near Maidenhead, Reading and Newbury. In Surrey, there are hold-offs on the A31 Farnham Bypass at Hickley's Corner. Finally, on the A335 in Eastleigh, there are major roadworks between Lee Road and the Town Hall. Worth remembering if you're heading for the airport through the town centre. The weather news, well actually if you fancy going for it's going to be nice all day so you don't have to go out this morning. Here's the summary, dry and sunny. Temperatures climbing to around 16 degrees Celsius. That's a sunny 60 degrees Fahrenheit. The winds will be light to moderate northeasterly. That's it, join us again in half an hour. In the next hour, after these deaths, are too many kids now being taken into care? Madonna's latest movie, Why Shanghai Surprise Lacks Eastern Promise. And tips from Titch on the creepy crawlies in your garden. That's all in the next hour on Breakfast Time.
security. Officials at the State Department do not expect the meetings here to produce a date for another summit. They do expect them to show whether one is possible. The Soviet Union insists that Mr. Danilov is a spy. Mr. Gorbachev said yesterday he'd been caught red-handed. They want to swap Danilov for the Soviet official Gennady Zakharov, who's been accused of spying in New York. The Americans have refused. They've ordered 25 Soviet officials to leave the UN in New York, and they say the Danilov affair must be resolved today. American and Soviet delegates have been working throughout the night in Stockholm to try to finalize an agreement on reducing the risks of nuclear war in Europe. They've been talking for three years, but today has been set as the deadline for agreement. The head of the American team has criticized Washington for apparently leaking details of his negotiating brief. The French government and an Arab terrorist group have both threatened to inflict vengeance on the other after the latest violence in Paris and Beirut. A promise by the French Prime Minister Jacques Chirac to respond to the bombings with crushing, pitiless action is interpreted as using hit squads or even bombing raids into Lebanon. The group, called the Anti-Imperialist International Brigade, replied by saying it shot the French military attaché Christian Gutierre in Beirut and would kill more French diplomats. Rival groups say they carried out the Paris bombing in which five people died. All share a common purpose, to protest at French policy towards the Arabs and free Arab prisoners. The French establishment has been shocked by the deaths. The government is worried by the threat to its authority and has promised to fight terrorism to the finish. This has led to the high-profile security measures such as the patrols of the riot police on the Champs-Élysées and other major public places. The government is trying to live down the embarrassment of advertising a million franc reward for two Arabs who turned up at their home in Lebanon. The two Lebanese originally wanted in France are two of the Abdallah brothers. Later, the French said another brother had been in the bombing raid, but he too turned up in his home village. The bombing campaign has been to free Georges Abdallah, the oldest of five brothers, all said to have been trained in terrorist camps. He's held in jail in France. The two brothers named on the wanted posters in France and for whom a million francs was offered are Robert and Maurice. They said their passport showed they'd not left home. The 20-year-old Robert flatly denied that he'd been involved or indeed had ever been in France. Uh, to me, uh, first, uh, I never uh, went to Paris. I'm always here. Uh, second, uh, I study uh, at Lebanon at uh, my university at Lebanon. 25-year-old Maurice Abdallah also denied being involved, but all the family are now being guarded against the danger of French or Israeli hit squads taking revenge. The conflicting evidence linking the pill with breast cancer is to be investigated by the Drugs Watchdog, the Committee on Safety of Medicines. The inquiry has been prompted by today's release of two new reports. One says long-term use increases the risk of developing the disease, but the other contains strong evidence against the theory. Our science correspondent, James Wilkinson, reports. There are about three and a half million women on the pill in Britain. About twice that number have taken it in the past. The possibility that the pill may cause breast cancer was first raised nine years ago. Since then, there's been a lot of research to find out the truth. Today's two reports come to very different conclusions, so the doctors are still unsure. The report in The Lancet comes from Scandinavia. Doctors studied about 400 women who developed breast cancer. They concluded that those women who'd taken the pill for 12 years or more roughly doubled their chances of getting the disease. But the second survey from New Zealand, and published in the British Medical Journal, has found otherwise. 433 women with breast cancer were studied. Doctors found no connection between their illness and their use of the birth control pill. Last month, a third, much bigger, and possibly more reliable study done in America also found no evidence of a link between the pill and breast cancer. The Drug Safety Committee in Britain is to discuss the report next week, but the committee's chairman says at the moment there's no need to change the use of the pill. The police in Surrey say that more than 200 pickets were in Byfleet last night, throwing missiles and flares at a depot which distributes News International publications. One lorry was damaged, the driver was slightly injured and is still in hospital. Two policemen were also hurt and three pickets were arrested. About 20 demonstrators chained themselves to barricades outside Fulbeck airfield yesterday evening as they prepared for an all-night vigil. They'll be trying to prevent the nuclear waste agency Nyrex from going ahead with test drilling on the Lincolnshire site. 
More than 70 people were arrested last night when police raided a pub in Gillingham in Kent. 130 officers, led by members of the drug squad, moved in on the Monarch an hour before closing time. The police say they removed some substances for examination. Andrew Taylor reports. The Monarch pub had been under police surveillance for some time. Last night's raid came at about 9.30, an hour or so before closing time. The raid itself was over in a few minutes. 130 police, some of them with specially trained sniffer dogs. But the searches went on for several hours. Around the pub, roads have been closed off. More than 70 people were arrested, though most of them have now been allowed to go home. The police have brought in special vans in which to search and question them on the spot. Well, I marched the cell, hands behind the back, hands behind the head, and I, I took us out. And I took us into the vans, strip searched us. I had stripped down totally naked into the vans. And that took about two and a half hours. It's not known yet what drugs or what quantities were seized, but the operation is part of a crackdown Kent police have been warning off for some time on the peddling of heroin and cocaine in the county. The Philippine president, Corazon Aquino, has gained a remarkable personal triumph on her visit to America. After her appeal to a joint session of Congress, the House of Representatives approved new aid of $200 million to the Philippines. President Aquino will now ask American banks for more liberal repayment terms for her country's $26,000 million foreign debt. President Aquino was given a warm welcome by the joint meeting, despite reservations felt at the new government's policy towards the American bases. She said she was coming home again. Martin Bell asked if she'd been surprised by the friendliness of her welcome. It really is just unbelievable, I have to tell you that. And uh, as I said, three years ago when I left uh, the United States, it was as a widowing grief and that I thought that maybe I would not be visiting here anymore. I really didn't know what was in store for me. So I guess this is another miracle. And that's it. The summary is at 7.30. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Senior social services administrators are meeting in Cardiff this week at a time when their profession is under siege. There has been tremendous publicity surrounding a number of recent cases where children have died at the hands of their parents. And each time, the youngsters were already under the care of the social services. And each time, the key question seems to have been, could the death have been prevented if the child had been removed earlier? 21-month-old Tyra Henry, remember, was killed by her father. But reports suggest that social service staff should have intervened sooner. Following the killing of seven-year-old Tina Beechuk, another outcry in the press and similar calls for swift action. And then after Jasmine Beckford was killed by her stepfather, a major inquiry was set up and concluded that, among the many errors made, staff had been far too reluctant to separate Jasmine from her parents. But of course, in every case of this kind, there's bound to be conflict between, on the one hand, the desire to try to keep the family together, and on the other, the fear that if the social worker doesn't intervene early enough, the results could be tragic. Well, I'm joined now by Neil Kay, who's in our Cardiff studio. Mr Kay, very good morning to you. Good morning to you. I gather you've described the Beckford report as unhelpful. Well, I'm not surprised it's unhelpful. You, you had your, your knuckles wrapped. You were found wanting, weren't you? I also said that, in many ways, the report was a good report, and I felt it would contribute to saving the lives of some children. I did think that judgment ought to be qualified by saying some parts of the report were less helpful. But there were shortcomings in the system, which is, is what you're discussing in Cardiff this week, right? Yes, yes. What are, you, what are you up to? I mean, how are you going to put things right? What I want to see happen is uh, social workers enabled to make these judgments without having the fear and anxiety around them that they're going to be pilloried in the press and possibly face disciplinary consequences every time they get something wrong. I think that's creating problems throughout the country because these are difficult judgments and need to be taken in a balanced way. But the, I accept they are very difficult judgments and I think everybody sympathises with the dilemma you have as to whether to do one thing or the other. But it has to be a balanced judgment and the suggestion is that, that you're not frankly up to it, that you have been exercising a balanced judgment. The reports re refer to a number of um, specific cases. Mistakes have been made and obviously we, we don't want to deny that or that uh, procedures sometimes have to be changed and perhaps tightened up. Uh, I think not enough emphasis has been given to the fact that with, with social workers, particularly the frontline workers, being criticised so much, um, it's difficult for them to take any degree of risks now and sometimes children are kept away from parents unnecessarily. Publicity is given to a child who dies 
not to a four or five year old who's very distressed at being kept away from parents with whom underlying he has a good relationship. But you have such a responsible job and you're working in such a sensitive area that you are going to be criticised. I think you have to accept that if you get it wrong, aren't you? Obviously, we, 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 criticism will take place. But the social worker who makes a mistake, for example, seems to get a great deal of uh, public criticism, even the job being at risk. A policeman who makes a mistake, as a result of which a child could dies, uh, there's far more public sympathy once it's proved to be a mistake and not, a, not something deliberate. Uh, and you're suggesting then, are you, that, that uh, the current feeling is that, that you're playing it too safe? In other words, the pendulum is swinging the other way and you're tending to keep uh, children in care longer than good judgment uh, uh, sort of suggests to you? Uh, this, may be, this, this, I believe, is happening in, in some cases and in some instances. Um, the, deciding which children need to remain in care and should come in care and be separated from the parents for a long time and which children should stay with parents and go home needs the evidence to be balanced up very carefully and social workers being worried about being pilloried and persecuted uh, is, and the anxiety that goes with this is not the best circumstances into which make, to make these cool judgments. Now, how are you going to improve the system of making the judgment? If that is at the core of the problem, that is the difficulty deciding what to do in a particular case. Um, I mean, how are you going to improve that judgment making? Because that, it seems to me, is what you've got to do, isn't it? I mean, will more people make it? Will more experienced people make it? Will there be support for the social worker making the decision? How are you going to improve on that? This, this is where the recommendations of some of the uh, reports and the subsequent um, uh, circulars that come out have undoubtedly been helpful. Um, suggesting ways that we can tighten up the procedures and make sure that uh, judgments are taken in collaboration and that we've um, much tighter systems for making sure that when children do go home uh, the um, follow-up is regular and, uh, and of a kind that uh, makes sure the child is seen and the medical checks and things like that. All that is happening and all that is good. Um, there are other things happening, I believe, that are less good. Well, Mr. Kay, thank you very much indeed. It's a very sensitive subject which you're dealing with, and we wish you well. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, this morning we have as our very special guest the American comedian Kelly Monteith. Kelly is starting a British tour next weekend. A confirmed Anglophile, he says he particularly likes being here because censorship is much freer than that of the States. Before we embark on a discussion of our liberal attitudes, let's first have a taste of Kelly Monteith in action. <laughs> what is this, a conspiracy? Come on, I just got your cousin the coffee maker fixed. No wonder I don't get anything done. All you appliances were supposed to save me time so I could have time to do things I never had time to do before I got you. Now I just spend all my time, wasting time, trying to get you time savers fixed. <laughs> supposed to give me the freedom to do what I wanted to do. Be free as a bird. Which is a fallacy, really. Because birds aren't free. They're not, they're really, they're prisoners of their instincts. I mean, birds have no say-so in their lives. When's the last time you saw a bird that slept late? <laughs> <laughs> now that, that's, 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 that's a, a, amusing because you, you're in a very sort of everyday situation mm -hmm. and you've picked on the thoughts that we probably all have. But how do you how do you kind of get them all together and present them in such a, an amusing way? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know really. I just keep working on uh, on my stuff. It's sort of a, in a constant state of evolution, and you just keep uh, working on it and adding things, and you find something over here fits better with something over here and then you put that over here and it's sort of like a jigsaw puzzle that you're constantly working on and uh, so you don't and say you have new thoughts sometimes you have a thought and then a couple even sometimes a couple of years later you get another thought that fits with that that one and then you get a new routine it's how do you remember process. the old one though i mean how does it happen oh i've got little books sometimes i'll go through them and, and look uh, look up and i'll see one thing that fits a new thought i'll put that <coughs> put that in with that so it's, it's very uh, Interesting process, keeps you, keeps you on your toes, keeps you busy. Do, do you have to have two sets of material, one for the States and one for, one for here? No, I have to change words, though. Since What's I've it? been here for, for a while, I've got to like change diapers to nappies and, and uh, canned to tin, you know, anything that's canned is tinned. And, and all these minute little things that you don't think about until you get to the word and you realize that nobody's going to understand it. I was in America recently and I, 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 asked, I asked somebody if they would knock me up at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> That was an awful hush <laughs> fell on the assembly. I bet you get an instinct response. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Did they knock you off? Yeah, it's really hot. Very right? difficult. Yeah. Full of problems. Especially when you're on stage, because it's crucial if you hit one word that's 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 really crucial to the punchline. And if nobody, and if people have to take two or three seconds to figure out what it is, then you've lost the joke. You know, it's gone. So you've got to really. What about the censorship? We keep hearing about the moral right and stuff in America. Is, it, is censorship getting bad over there? Well, it's particularly on television. American television is, is they drive you crazy with the censorship. You have to go over every word and every line of the script. And I was amazed when I came here, and nobody really, really was on your back about it. Oh, there is a little bit. I mean, they're not going to let you go crazy, but uh, in fact, I think you censor yourself, and consequently, you become a little more judicious about it. So, well, but, what sort of stuff could you get away with here, then, when you started? Because it was 79 when you started your... your yes, 79, series, right. What could you get away with here that you couldn't get away with in the States? Oh, a little uh, freer in the language, and um, a little freer on topics that we consider adults, such as... Uh, diapers. Adult diapers <laughs> and, and uh, sexual topics, although not, there again, not delving in too deep into it, where it becomes salacious. You just skirmish but, with but it. But you can't see this. There's, there's, there's so many different factions in America. You got the Bible Belt in the South, and you got these people over here in this fundamentalist group here. And we're watching television. We're not going to buy these products if, if we see these programs talk about this certain thing. So they're 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 really um, very tight on censorship. Yeah, they're really driving okay, crazy yeah. with it. Well, thanks just for the moment. Paul, you'd be called a sportscaster in the States, I suppose. That's yeah. Very good morning to you out there in the uh, big wide world. We're topping the sports news this morning with golf. I was speaking English. And uh, after the first round of the Lawrence Batley Tournament Players Championship taking place, the Belfry yesterday, Europe's Ryder Cup heroes, of which eight are playing, are having rather mixed fortunes. Sam Torrance, who hit the winning putt, of course, at the Belfry last year, has a shoulder injury, and so he hit a seven over par 79. But Jose Rivero is joined second with two under par. Manuel Pinero finished one over par with a 73, alongside the favourite for the tournament. That's the Scot Ken Brown, who took Greg Norman to a playoff at the Panasonic at the weekend. But leading the tournament with three under par 69s are Jeff Hawkes of South Africa and Greg Turner of New Zealand, brother of the former Test cricketer Glenn Turner. Now on Sunday, Nigel Mansell will be looking to extend his lead in the World Drivers Championship in the Portuguese Grand Prix. At the moment, of course, he leads teammate Nelson Piquet by just five. You will have heard uh, some senior figures in the field believe, in fact, that the pendulum is now swinging too far the other way. I think not enough emphasis has been given to the fact that with, with social work, particularly the frontline workers being criticised so much, um, it's difficult for them to take any degree of risks now, and sometimes children are kept away from parents unnecessarily. Publicity is given to a child who dies, not to a four or five year old who's very distressed at being kept away from parents with whom, underlying, he has a good relationship. Well, the man who conducted the Becker inquiry with his highly critical report is with me now, Louis Blanc Cooper, QC. Very good morning to you. They do have a problem. How do you react to that? They now feel so edgy about the whole thing that they may be making uh, bad decisions that are never publicised, in other words, keeping the child in care too long. Well, I think there is something in what Mr K says, that the pendulum swings backwards and forwards, and at the moment, perhaps, social workers are reacting in a much more offensive way. But I want to make quite clear that there's a real distinction between the case where there's suspicion of abuse of a child, and the social workers have got a very difficult uh, decision to make. Do we or do we not go to the courts and ask for care or for removing the child from its family? Now, the Beckford case was not about that, and therefore any criticism that might be made of social workers isn't due to our report, because our report was concerned with a case where there had been clear abuse, and the court had made a care order, handed the child to the local authority, so the local authority and social workers became the parent of the child. And that's a very different situation. We were critical of the decision of the social workers to decide to send the child home on trial, at least without the proper safeguards uh, to monitor what was happening to the child when the child was at home or when it was at school. But however, however the, the circumstances arose, uh, they are feeling that uh, the, the results were very unhelpful to them. Well, I think that's unfair. Uh, we certainly intended to be very helpful. And I think that everything that has been said officially, anyhow, and, and by social workers themselves since, really rather confirmed what we were saying. One of the main things that we pointed to was the uh, 
the reduction in the amount of specialist training for social workers. That is to say, the, the generic social work was the theme. That is to say, you should be able to deal with all kinds of social work problems, the aged, the mentally handicapped children. And what we were saying, and uh, the Department of Health and Social uh, uh, so, uh, Security has said in, in inspection reports and in studies of research, is that we've got to bring childcare specialism back into the fore so that it's given the priority that it deserves. You see, we need to help them to make what is a very difficult judgment indeed. We, we never hear of all the good judgments that they make, of course, and where things go well. It's only these isolated cases. Well, that, that's I'm just wondering how we do help them to make Well, that, that, that's very true, and it's true of all professions, that uh, you hear about you mistakes, about the mistakes. You hear the mistakes of lawyers as well as social workers. I think one of the things social workers can claim, and I think that I've been saying this in, uh, ever since the report came out when I've been speaking to them, is that social workers have the prime responsibility of carrying out uh, the, uh, the court's order, that is to say, whether it's a camera. And I think far too often the other agencies, health visitors, uh, doctors, paediatricians, um, lawyers perhaps as well, and others, have failed to give social workers the support that they need in coming to sensible decisions about the place for the children. Do you think they attract the right calibre of person to their ranks? Because they do get a very bad press, don't they? I think they get an appalling press. I think the press treats social workers really very badly. That's partly, of course, they're in the front line. They're, they're doing their job in the community and therefore much more visible. The whole lawyers and doctors do their work. Uh, I'd get uh, away with it, yeah. Well, not, we aren't entirely get away with it, but they've learned how to protect themselves. And I think social workers are enormously vulnerable. I think it is high time that, the, that some corrective was applied to this, and that they should be much better understood. Louis, thank you very much for completing that story for us this morning. Thank you very much. And now to add the time, and uh, quite a good day in prospect for a great many people, apart from the north, I guess. That's right. It's just Scotland with a significant weather today. The rest can be dismissed as unbroken sunshine. The atmosphere is a heat engine that works to equalise the hot tropic temperatures with the cold polar temperatures. A manifestation of that is a hurricane, for example. We have an extra tropical storm, Hurricane Earl, which has made its way into the Atlantic. It's encouraging a lot of warm and consequently wet air, cloudy air, along between Iceland and Scotland, and will continue to do so over the weekend. On its fringe over Scotland, some of this cloud is just pushing into the far north, a little bit of rain over the northwest. You can see elsewhere the skies are basically clear. So it's the behaviour of this shield that's important, and on the predictive sequence you'll see that there's not a lot going on today. There will no doubt, as the sun gets up with time and the land heats up, be one or two patches of cloud that just sort of bubble up off that clear. But it's in the north of Scotland there that the real rain happens, and it pushes down during the afternoon towards Glasgow and Edinburgh, the heavier rain. And that'll continue during tomorrow, actually, so it's only the southern half of tomorrow that can be fine. The next satellite image is at sunrise, a low pass, you'll see how clear most of the country was. Consequently, there's some fog patches around and cold temperatures. Well, this morning's weather chart, then it looks like this. A good deal of uh, cloud in the north, but just a bit of frost further south, and these fog patches are clearing now. Nothing significant, really. This afternoon, it's the progress of that that's important. The winds at midday, up to gale force off the northwest of Scotland. The temperatures, well, we're recovering slightly for autumn. And the summary chart for today, there it is.
Supporters of Worthing Football Club will be able to question directors about the club's troubles at a public meeting this evening. The club is £80,000 in debt. Home games are being played at Bognor because the Worthing ground still hasn't been granted a safety certificate. Divers from Poole have recovered the large propeller of a wartime RAF Wellington bomber off the Dorset coast. Members of the Hamworthy Sub-Aqua Club brought the barnacle-encrusted blade 70 feet to the surface off Weymouth using airbags. It's believed the propeller came from a Wellington bomber which sank after belly flopping on the sea over 40 years ago. The road news, well, there are still roadworks on the A24 near Ashington in Sussex. On the M4, there are roadworks, that means lane closures in both directions near Maidenhead, Reading and Newbury. In Surrey, there are hold-ups on the A31 Farnham Bypass at Hinkley's Corner. And on the A335 in Eastleigh, there are major roadworks between Lee Road and the Town Hall. Well, the weatherman on Radio 4 said this morning it was going to be a nice warm day. But that seems to mean just one degree warmer than yesterday. Still, we can't complain. It's going to be a lovely day, dry and sunny. Temperatures climbing to 16 degrees Celsius, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the warm warmth of today. The winds will be light to moderate northeasterly. There's the summary, dry and sunny. Join me again in half an hour's time. In the next hour, Gorbachev's messenger prepares to meet Reagan's man. Is the summit doomed? The Alps by elephant. Ian Botham hits the high road for charity. And Billy Bragg on TV's Rock Extravaganza. That's all on breakfast time between 8 and 9. Friday the 19th of September. A very good morning to you from all of us here on Breakfast Time. The news headlines today. Talks in Washington to pave the way for another United States-Soviet summit are due to take place today, but they're being held amid tension over the expulsion of Soviet United Nations officials from the United States and over American journalist Nicholas Danilov, who faces spying charges in Moscow. There are reports that France may be planning to use hit squads to avenge the Paris bombings. And here at home, police in Kent have made a big drugs raid. With the details, here's Sukhan. Good morning. Good morning. The Americans and the Soviets are holding top-level talks today to try to find a way out of the diplomatic maze that has grown up around the case of Nikola Stanilov. The Soviet Foreign Minister, Edward Shevardnadze, will hear renewed demands to drop spy charges against the American journalist when he meets his American counterpart, George Shultz, in Washington. The two men will also be trying to rescue plans for a summit meeting between President Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev. From Washington, Martin Bell. The talks start early and last for two days, but with very different perceptions of what the agenda should be. From the American point of view, the Danilov case is at the top of it. To the Russians, that's just a routine irritant in superpower relations. Such incidents have happened before. And uh, may happen in the future in the relations between states. This is undesirable, but unfortunately it does happen. But the Americans are not conciliatory. National Security Advisor John Poindexter on the expelled Soviet diplomats. The whole point of the message in the UN is that the United States is no longer going to tolerate uh, espionage being conducted out of the United Nations, out of the missions there, with impunity. Officials at the State Department do not expect the meetings here to produce a date for another summit. They do expect them to show whether one is possible. In his first public comment on the Danilov affair, Mr. Gorbachev has said the American had been caught red-handed. He wants to swap the alleged Soviet spy, Gennady Sakharov, for Danilov. The Americans said no, and yesterday ordered 25 Soviet officials to leave the United Nations in New York. They say the affair must be resolved today. American and Soviet delegates worked into the night in Stockholm to try to finalize an agreement on reducing the risk of nuclear war in Europe. They've been talking for three years, but today has been set as the deadline for agreement. The French government and an Arab terrorist group have both threatened to inflict vengeance on each other after the latest violence in Paris and Beirut. 
a promise by the French Prime Minister Jacques Chirac to respond to the bombings with crushing, pitiless action is interpreted as using hit squads or even bombing raids into Lebanon. And a group called the Anti-Imperialist International Brigade replied by saying it shot the French military attaché Christian Gauthier in Beirut and would kill more French diplomats. Rival groups say they carried out the Paris bombing in which five people died. All share a common purpose, to protest at French policy towards the Arabs and free Arab prisoners. The French establishment has been shocked by the deaths. The government is worried by the threat to its authority and has promised to fight terrorism to the finish. This has led to the high-profile security measures such as the patrols of the riot police on the Champs-Élysées and other major public places. The government is trying to live down the embarrassment of advertising a million franc reward for two Arabs who turned up at their home in Lebanon. The two Lebanese originally wanted in France are two of the Abdullah brothers. Later, the French said another brother had been in the bombing raid, but he too turned up in his home village. The bombing campaign has been to free Georges Abdullah, the oldest of five brothers, all said to have been trained in terrorist camps. He's held in jail in France. The two brothers, named on the wanted posters in France and for whom a million francs was offered, are Robert and Maurice. They said their passports showed that they had not left home. 20-year-old Robert flatly denied he'd been involved or had ever been in France. Uh, to me, uh, first, uh, I never uh, went to Paris. I always here. Uh, second, uh, I study uh, at Lebanon at uh, my university at Lebanon. 25-year-old Maurice Abdallah also denied being involved, but all the family are now being guarded against the danger of French or Israeli hit squads taking revenge. Here at home, more than 70 people were arrested last night when police raided a pub in Gillingham in Kent. 130 officers, led by members of the drug squad, moved in on the Monarch an hour before closing time. The police say they removed some substances for examination. Andrew Taylor reports. The Monarch pub had been under police surveillance for some time. Last night's raid came at about 9.30, an hour or so before closing time. The raid itself was over in a few minutes. 130 police, some of them with specially trained sniffer dogs. But the searches went on for several hours. Around the pub, roads have been closed off. More than 70 people were arrested, though most of them have now been allowed to go home. The police have brought in special vans in which to search and question them on the spot. Well, I marched the cell, ends beyond the back, ends beyond the head, and I, I took a cell. And I took us into the vans, strip searched us. I just stripped down totally naked into the vans. And that took about two and a half hours. It's not known yet what drugs or what quantities were seized, but the operation is part of a crackdown Kent police have been warning of for some time on the peddling of heroin and cocaine in the county. The conflicting evidence linking the pill with breast cancer is to be investigated by the Drugs Watchdog, the Committee on Safety of Medicines. The inquiry has been prompted by today's release of two new reports. One says long-term use increases the risk of developing the disease, but the other contains strong evidence against the theory. Our science correspondent, James Wilkinson, reports. There are about three and a half million women on the pill in Britain. About twice that number have taken it in the past. The possibility that the pill may cause breast cancer was first raised nine years ago. Since then, there's been a lot of research to find out the truth. Today's two reports come to very different conclusions, so the doctors are still unsure. The report in The Lancet comes from Scandinavia. Doctors studied about 400 women who developed breast cancer. They concluded that those women who'd taken the pill for 12 years or more roughly doubled their chances of getting the disease. But the second survey from New Zealand, and published in the British Medical Journal, has found otherwise. 433 women with breast cancer were studied. Doctors found no connection between their illness and their use of the birth control pill. Last month, a third, much bigger, and possibly more reliable study done in America also found no evidence of a link between the pill and breast cancer. The Drug Safety Committee in Britain is to discuss the report next week, but the committee's chairman says at the moment there's no need to change the use of the pill. The police in Surrey say that more than 200 pickets were in Byfleet last night, throwing missiles and flares at a depot which distributes News International publications. One lorry was damaged, the driver was slightly injured and is still in hospital. Two policemen were also hurt and three pickets were arrested. 
About 20 demonstrators chained themselves to barricades outside Fulbeck Airfield yesterday evening as they prepared for an all-night vigil. They'll be trying to prevent the nuclear waste agency Nirex from going ahead with test drilling on the Lincolnshire site. In Sri Lanka, government troops have been accused of massacring 47 Tamils in Batikaloa. A Tamil separatist group based in South India claimed that the massacre was a reprisal for a car bomb explosion that killed 10 people in the town. The first anniversary of the earthquakes that brought widespread death and destruction to Mexico City will be marked with a demonstration by thousands of homeless people. At least 5,000 people are estimated to have died in the two major tremors that struck the city within 36 hours. The Mexican Red Cross have issued a report saying that 100,000 people are still without permanent shelter. And that's the news. There's more at 8.30. That's back to Frank. Thank you very much. Well, today's meeting between the American Secretary of State, George Shultz, and his Soviet counterpart is intended to pave the way to a second Reagan-Gorbachev summit. But after the events of the past few days, the climate between the two superpowers could hardly be worse. As we've just heard there, the United Nations is now involved itself. They say that the American decision to expel en masse 25 Soviet diplomats to the United Nations goes against a key United Nations agreement. Our reporter in New York, Tom Brook, asked a United Nations spokesman, Francois Giuliani, to explain in what way the expulsions contravene the 47 agreement. Well, what we mean is that uh, the, the legal difficulty stems from the fact that this is a measure of uh, collective expulsion to enforce a reduction in the size of the mission. It is not an expulsion for the individual behavior of the, the members of the mission. So the problem, in other words, is that the expulsion order relates to a group of individuals rather than one or two individuals. Well, uh, well, the matter at issue and what we have recommended that there should be consultations about is, the, is whether the, the number of personnel of a mission can be reduced unilaterally. How can the situation be resolved by the United Nations? Well, the Secretary General has offered uh, to both the United States and the Soviet Union to act informally as a sort of good officer between them and try to help them out of the situation. And that, of course, is the new ingredient of the story. The big question today, of course, is how the expulsions of the Danilov affair will affect the two-day meeting between the Soviet Foreign Minister, Edvard Shabadadze, and the American Secretary of State, George Shultz, which starts in Washington this very morning. Well, joining us now live from Washington is George Carver. He's a former deputy director of the CIA, now a foreign affairs expert at Georgetown University. Mr. Carver, very good morning to you. Good, good morning. Can we start with, with Danilov as a way into this story? Because the Americans have set this as a kind of deadline for Danilov Day, and clearly he'll be top of the agenda in these talks. What happens if he's not released? Well, if he is top of the agenda, then Shevardnadze stares from the middle distance and says, well, I've heard you, now let's go into item two. Then we're going to have a very serious situation indeed, and an impasse that's got to be resolved before there can be a meaningful discussion at the summit level. If that isn't discussed properly, uh, is Schultz going to even continue the talks? Well, Schultz may continue the talks because we have a lot of issues to go, to go over, but he will not, I think, arrange the details of a summit if the Soviets stand fast on this particular point. Are you suggesting he might actually walk out? I don't think he'll walk out, but we've got to remember that Gorbachev today called Ronald Reagan a liar because Ronald Reagan sent Gorbachev a personal message assuring him that Danilov had no intelligence connection with the United States and Gorbachev today said that he had been caught red-handed and dead. Now, Gorbachev has told Ronald Reagan, the President of the United States, to take a long walk off a short pier. And that is not the kind of atmosphere that is conducive to a summit. And in fact, if we were to try a summit under these circumstances, the results could be very dangerous indeed. Now, you're giving me the message that, that this is now developing into a very volatile situation. How serious is it? Well, it's potentially very serious. We have to go back 25 years to see the potential danger. In February 1961, John Kennedy asked for a summit. Then came the Bay of Pigs. In April of 1961, on the 22nd, Khrushchev sent Kennedy probably the most insulting message a president of the United States has ever received. Then three weeks later, he flip-flopped and he said he'd like to have a summit. This was on the 12th of May. And they got together in June. Khrushchev went into that summit feeling that John Kennedy could be bullied and could be cozened. He was ultimately patronizing and insulting, and he came away confirmed in his views. The fallout from that was 
the Berlin Wall, the resumption of nuclear testing by the Soviets, though Khrushchev had promised Kennedy that they would never be the first to do that, and 14 months later, the Cuban Missile Crisis. The 14-odd months after the 1961 summit were a very dicey period indeed. You're not and should Gorbachev go into any summit with Reagan, harboring similar illusions, I can assure you that the 14 months after that would be a sportier course than you or I or any of your listeners would want to traverse. You're even suggesting that that scenario might be repeated? I think that it would be repeated if we are, do not make it very clear that we are standing firm on Danilov, it was not we who got him arrested. The president has given his personal word that he is in fact an innocent journalist, as all of his colleagues in Moscow know him to be. And if Secretary General Gorbachev refuses to accept that and insist on making this an escalating situation, trying to bluff the president and bully him, then that is not set the kind of atmosphere in which meaningful discussions can be profitably held. Presumably the president's back has been further put up by this United Nations affair. Here he is saying 25 uh, uh, diplomats have got to go back. And uh, the United Nations is saying, I'm sorry, mate, you, you can't actually do that. Well, it's a considerably more complicated than that. I'm not a lawyer. I don't want to go into the minutiae of the 1947 headquarters agreement. But the, the Soviets have a mission in the United Nations that is more than two times the size of the next two largest missions combined, the United States mission and the Chinese mission. This Soviet mission has long been a hotbed of Soviet espionage, heavily stabbed with KGB and GRU officers. They have a total of 275 people in their mission at the moment, counting Belarusians and Ukrainians. That's not to include the 254 people they have in the Secretariat. Now, the United States taxpayer sees no reason why he should subsidize KGB activity being run out of the UN. Last March, we told the Soviets they were going to have to cut down. We're simply doing today what we said yeah. last March was going to have to be done. That's true. Given, given this, this tit-for-tat that seems to be going on all the time, do you think that they genuinely want a summit, uh, the American leader and the Russian leader? Do they really want to get together and talk about arms limitation and testing and so on? Well, to an extent, yes, but I think that uh, Secretary General Gorbachev and the way he's handled the Danilov case, both by having Danilov arrested and then his posture thereafter, seems to think that he wants to hold it under circumstances and situations which give him a permanent psychological edge, roughly of a kind that Khrushchev tried to establish in 1961. And if he persists in that line, he's going to make the world very dangerous for all of us. Mr. Carver, thank you very much indeed. By the way, it's much appreciated that you stay behind. I know it's the middle of the night in Washington. That's much appreciated. Well, it's three, it's three o'clock in the morning, but I'm always glad to talk to the BBC. That's kind of you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That's good to hear. Now, this weekend, sportsmen Ian Botham will be grabbing the headlines once again. Not on the cricket pitch, but on an elephant. On Sunday in the Channel Islands, he plans to give a preview of his latest and most extravagant charity fundraising scheme. Last year, Botham raised thousands of pounds for leukemia research by walking from John O'Groats to Land's End. Now, with a few elephants, he plans a sponsored walk over the Alps, following in the footsteps of that famous historical character, Hannibal. And in Jersey on Sunday, Botham will get in some early training. And as Bob Whitaker discovered, he certainly needs it. Enter a rather large new television star, Lola. Only five, but already she's a ton and a quarter. Oh, yeah, great big Here comes another, more established star of ample proportions, Ian Botham. He may be giving the heave ho to Somerset, but surely he can't be running away to join a circus. Right. <sighs> Whoa. The big fella does look a bit stumped aboard Lola. Still, he's got 17 months to get his act together before the Botham army heads across the Alps to retrace the steps of another larger-than-life character, Hannibal. In 219 BC, Hannibal took 60,000 troops and 40 elephants on the epic journey to knock the Romans for six. This modern-day legend has less warlike ambitions. He's just taking a few friends and four elephants. The mission? To raise one million pounds for his favourite charity, Leukemia Research. It was an amazing feat, and uh, I think that you know, just to try and do it um, would be an achievement to, uh, to follow the man. But when you think when he did it all those centuries ago uh, and fought about 
half a dozen battles on the way. Absolutely amazing. So, I think it'll draw a lot of interest and that's obviously a good way of getting more money for the leukemia fund. The cricketer is well trodden in the art of long charity marches. Last November, with three pals, he trekked 900 miles from John O'Groves to Land's End, eventually raising £800,000 for leukaemia. That same team will take on the more ambitious Alps adventure. One of them, Phil Rance, whose father died of leukaemia, is organising the journey. Of course, where both of them goes, so does his minder, Andy Withers, just to keep him from falling off Mont Blanc. Andy, you looked after Ian during the leukaemia war from John O'Groves to Land's End. How do you think he's going to cope with the Alps? Well, I don't think he'll, he'll worry too much about it. You know, I mean, obviously the worst thing is going to be the cold, but um, we're following in four-wheel drive vehicles, so we'll have plenty of warm clothing, hot drinks, this sort of thing, bags of long johns, thermal underwear sort of thing, you know. But uh, I think it's right, as long as we keep moving. And we're not actually staying in a tent on top of the old seats, I think we're going to be shifting back to a hotel. So, I should imagine it'll be all right. It'll be February 1988 when Botham's troops head off on Hannibal's historic 1,000 mile journey. Starting from Cartagena in southern Spain, meandering up the coast through Barcelona into the swirling heights of the Pyrenees. Then sliding down onto the desolate French plains of the Camargue. A little climb up again into the high Alps. And finally, eight weeks later, a gentle limp down to Italy and Turin. It's so vast, the progress. I mean, it's probably the biggest single charity undertaking ever made. So really, it's a vastness that is difficult to comprehend at this stage, really. That's how big the project is. Why did you personally decide you wanted to undertake such a big project? Uh, excluding madness. It, it's, it's just so appealing, the whole thing. I mean, <clears throat> the, the idea was born through Ian, of course, as, as part of his crusade against leukaemia. And I just quite simply started reading the Hannibal books. I mean, we toyed with the idea initially of perhaps doing half of the room, things of this nature, but once you read the book, you've got to do the whole thing, you know. It, it would be sacrilege not to do the whole thing. It's just a marvellous story. Oh, left, turn left. Left. This modern-day Hannibal, though, looks a bit short on riding practice, but Ian will get that on Sunday, when Lola and the gang join him for a 30-mile trot around Jersey to do some fundraising. That'll be a doddle, of course, but will he really make it across the Alps? Now, you do have to ask me that question. Now, be serious. You did the last one. You actually have to consider whether I'll do it or not. Of course I'll do it. As well, it looks like Lola wants to go over here. So I'll see you later. I think he'll do it too. That was Bob Whitaker reporting there. And on breakfast time on Monday, we'll have a special report on what the Channel Islanders make of Hannibal Botham. And Kelly Monteith's with us this morning. What do you make of Hannibal Botham? Doesn't look very big, that elephant, though. I expect elephants to be monstrous. Have you seen how big Ian like Botham is? Have no. you seen how <laughs> <laughs> You have a point. He'd be a monstrous guy. I've flown that same kind of airline, so he's going to have a great time with it. Luggage will end up in Rome, probably. Does it appeal to you doing something like that? Yeah, something actually, I would like to. Uh, I'm sort of adventurous that way. Oh, know, you? I had the time and. and uh, I, did, I didn't think what? you were a sort of sporty, adventurous type. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I drove. Uh, anybody that, that survived the, the kind of driving I did around America, uh, you have to be adventurous doing that, sleeping in your car and driving all the way. I was first starting out in cars constantly. And I, I, I like that sort of thing, actually. It'd be kind of fun. Perhaps you could do your next tour on that on, on, on elephant? elephants. I yeah. Would, uh, yes, I'm, I'm planning it. I keep your material fresh, won't it? <laughs> yeah, I was I was reading in your notes, and I've made a little note here, and it says, "At school, a little fatty." You Big weren't, were you? Were you a little fatty at school? Yes, I was a roly poly kid, very uh, very chubby. I don't know why, and uh, I still, you know, you eat that regenerative food, you know, like donuts which you chew up and break down its parts and then it reforms in its original <laughs> shape right here. You know that kind of food I'm talking about? Pizzas. It's like radiation gets in your bones and comes out some aberration on your body later on. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know why. I just was a chubby little kid. A lot of people are, are chubby and then they sort of lose it when they get older. And, you, know, you lose all that baby fat. It's all the jokes keeps you hit. Well, running. <laughs> all running right, Kelly. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not so convinced that you are all that sporty, but uh, Paul McDowell's <laughs> here now. 
you, what do you think? Do you think he's a, a sports type? I'm disappointed, Debbie. I thought you were going to say I was sporty. Well, no, I would never, I would never really say that. I never lie before <laughs> 8.30 on well, a Friday Well, Kelly was morning. talking about driving. We're going to miss what I'm driving to begin with. Golf, that is, because the first round of the Lawrence Batley Tournament Players' Championship has just been completed at the Belfry. Europe's Ryder Cup heroes, of which eight are playing, are having mixed fortunes there. Sam Torrance, who of course hit the winning putt at the Belfry last year, has a shoulder injury. He hit a seven over par, 79. But Jose Rivero is joint second with two under par. Manuel Pinero finished one over par with a 73, along with the favourite for the tournament, Ken Brown, who took, of course, Greg Norman to a playoff at the Panasonic at the weekend. Now, leading the tournament with three under par 69s are Jeff Hawkes of South Africa and Greg Turner of New Zealand, brother of the former test cricketer Glenn Turner. Turn our attention to events on Sunday because Nigel Mansell will be looking to extend his lead in the World Drivers' Championship in the Portuguese Grand Prix. At the moment, he leads teammate Nelson Piquet by just five points, while champion Alain Prost and, of course, Ayrton Senna are still in the hunt. Nigel, who took the chequered flag at Brands Hatch in July, hasn't won a Grand Prix since. Portugal is obviously his mind, but what would the World Championship mean to him? Not even thinking about it. Not even thinking about it because there's three races to go and uh, one doesn't torture themselves. I'm putting all my energies into doing as good a job as I can for the next three races and uh, if we can crack it I'll tell you that. If not, I have no idea. Of course you can see it on Sunday in Grandstand but we've got some racing for you today. The horse variety that is, is from Newbury starting at BBC One at quarter past two this afternoon. Now Richard Pittman's tip of the day is Dick Hearn's two-year-old Merce Cunningham. That's running in the 2.30. Merce Cunningham 2.30 at Newbury. We're looking now at Lem Hill leading home the field in the Moreland Brewery Stakes. And although he was disqualified for bumping, Richard reckons he's best value for money in tomorrow's featured race at Newbury. That's the Coral Autumn Cup starting at 2 o'clock. Now, in the 3.30 at Newbury, the two year olds have a formidable task in trying to beat Forrest Flaar. This was her biggest victory of the season at Royal Ascot back in June. This looks like another for Matt Henry as Forrest Flaar strides away from him as they race into the closing stages, being pressed by Propensity, but Forrest Flaar is going to stay there and at the line. Forrest Flaar is the winner, Propensity is second. Just to return to Ian Botham, he was asked yesterday by speculation that his former manager Tim Hudson could guarantee him and Viv Richards £50,000 to play for Lancashire. Well, both of them said maybe Hudson ought to realise that money doesn't count for everything. Words, no doubt, that would be applauded by the great man Hannibal himself. Paul, well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, an Indian summer brewing up, perhaps? Yes, possibly, yeah, possibly. It's certainly good today, and we have had it so cold in the south recently. There's an interesting jet stream across the uh, Atlantic here, a lot of cloud involved on it. Um, an extra tropical storm, an old hurricane, Hurricane Earl, is encouraging all this cloudy, wet, windy weather to shoot between Iceland and Scotland. If you're going from Scotland to Iceland or vice versa, plane or boat, you should check that out over the weekend. There's some quite heavy falls of rain and very strong winds. The fringe on the periphery here, just over the north of Scotland, you can see it just kind of flirting there with it. It'll come down further south as time goes by. The predictive sequence shows that it's going to be slow, but nevertheless it will block out the sun for many people over Scotland. The bright band getting into the north there at midday, the north of Scotland, I think that's the heavy rain, and that will in the afternoon slowly come on and make its way well towards Glasgow and Edinburgh, and then probably by midday tomorrow uh, some cloud will be over the north of England and the north of Arthur Island. Another image to have a look at from a low-flying satellite at sunrise shows the extent of the clear as the sun came up. You can see over the north the uh, clouds almost the same temperature as the same grey land underneath. And in the south, London, Kent, Sussex, a stream of cloud there. So this morning's weather chart then with starry skies, full moon has been cooling so long, low temperatures down to zero in quite a few areas. A few fog patches going rapidly now. The veil of cloud in the north beginning to come south. This afternoon that veil down here, probably by tomorrow midday, sort of down there. The winds are quite light apart from the north and west of Scotland, gales later on. Temperatures recovering to the 60s now. Summary chart for today. There you are. Just coming up to 28 minutes past eight. Good morning from the south. The news this morning, 11 people are still
still being questioned in Bournemouth after arrests made yesterday by drug squad officers. Various substances were seized in an operation codenamed Ottawa and are being treated by tested by forensic scientists. Three people from Bracknell are recovering from burns after a fiberglass cabin cruiser caught fire on the River Thames at Farringdon in Oxfordshire. Mrs Daphne Blake, who lives at Bishopdale in Bracknell, Bracknell is in a serious condition with severe burns at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. Her husband Charles and another woman, Mrs Brenda Andrews, have also been detained in hospital with burns. Now, if you haven't got anything to do yet this weekend, here are a few ideas. Armageddon 86, a war games and modelling fair, is on at the Hexagon in Reading over the weekend. It's one of the foremost events of its kind in the country, and I'm told it's not to be missed. Ringwood in Hampshire is in carnival mood tomorrow. The afternoon procession starts at 2, followed by another in the evening at 7.15. The Rotaract Club of Fairham are holding an It's a Knockout tournament tomorrow at Cattersfield. It's to raise money for the Special Olympics to be held on the Isle of Wight next year. Finally, something for boating enthusiasts. There's a boat jungle tomorrow in the Ocean Village complex at Southampton's Eastern Docks. It starts at 10 o'clock. And of course, the boat show is still on today and tomorrow is the last day. So today might be a good day because it's lovely weather. The, the travel news, if you haven't gone into them yet, there are roadworks on the A24 near Ashington, still causing problems for motorists in Sussex. On the M4, there are lane closures because of roadworks near Maidenhead, Reading and Newbury. In Surrey, there are hold-ups on the A31 Farnham Bypass at Hickley's Corner. And finally, on the A335 in Eastleigh, there are major roadworks between Lee Road and the Town Hall. Those ones are worth remembering, of course, if you're heading for the airport through Eastleigh Town Centre. Quick reminder, more news uh, from the south at 25 past one, at 25 past four this afternoon, and of course south today this evening at 6.35. Till then here's the weather news, dry and sunny, temperatures climbing to 16 degrees Celsius today, that's 60 degrees Fahrenheit, the winds will be light to moderate northeasterly. So another good day, dry and sunny, temperatures around 60 degrees Fahrenheit, it's a bit warmer than yesterday, winds light to moderate northeasterly. That's it for me. Have a nice weekend. Coming up, Rocking Through the Night, an eye-opener from Billy Bragg. And Titch takes your calls on those creepy crawly problems. Good morning. It's just turned 8.30 on the 19th of September. Here's Sue with a new summary. Good morning. The American Secretary of State George Shultz and the Soviet Foreign Minister Edward Shevardnadze begin talks today. They're part of preparations for a second summit between President Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev. As the talks open in Washington, Mr. Shultz's first priority is to raise the case of Nicholas Danilov, the American journalist who faces spying charges in Moscow. But yesterday, Mr. Shevardnadze played that issue down, saying the matter was unfortunate, but as he put it, such things happen. He said the Soviet Union was ready for a summit. The Americans don't expect the talks to provide a date, just to settle whether a summit is possible. In Lebanon, two brothers accused of involvement in the Parisian bomb attack say they'll sue the French government. Maurice and Robert Abdallah have been accused, along with their brother Emile, of launching terrorist attacks to secure the freedom of a fourth brother, Georges Ibrahim Abdallah, who's in a French jail. There have been five bombings in Paris in the past two weeks. It's rumoured that France will use hit squads to avenge them. In Sri Lanka, a Tamil organisation says that troops have killed 47 Tamils in reprisal for a car bomb that killed 10 people earlier in the day. It happened at Batikaloa, where a major anti-guerrilla offensive is taking place. Tamil groups say that after the bomb exploded by a bus station, soldiers went on the rampage, killing civilians. In Kent, more than 70 people have been arrested during a drug squad raid at Gillingham. 130 policemen took part in the raid, which centred on a pub in the town centre. Nearby roads were sealed off. Police say the pub had been under surveillance for some time. The police in Surrey say that more than 200 pickets were in Byfleet last night, throwing missiles and flares at a depot which distributes news international publications. One lorry was damaged and two depot employees were taken to hospital. They're not thought to be seriously injured. Three pickets were arrested. More than 20 demonstrators have kept a vigil through the night at Fulbeck Airfield in Lincolnshire. 
It's one of four sites that the nuclear waste executive Nirex wants to test as possible dump for low-level waste. This morning, Nirex contractors have gone onto the site at Killingholm in South Humberside, despite the presence of a small number of demonstrators. That's it. More news at nine. Thanks. Now, if you're one of those people who think they'll never ever grow out of rock music, then this weekend might just test your stamina. This Saturday afternoon sees the start of what can only be described as a rock marathon on BBC Two. It's called Rock Around the Clock, and the promise is almost 12 hours of non-stop music. One of the star shows is Billy Bragg, and with him is the presenter Andy Kershaw. Good morning to each other. Now, is this, is it, apart from Billy stuff, is this all up to the minute, or is it for ageing trendies, well, like our editor? Everybody. There's all sorts of stuff on. In fact, it's very hard to try and name a band that isn't on Rock Around the Clock. Uh, and it's more than 12 hours, actually. It's 13 it? hours of the stuff, yeah. But does that include the snooker or not? Uh, not snooker, <laughs> no. We've got news for the deaf halfway through, and we've got uh, a darts competition halfway through. We have to break off for those, but apart from that, it's just solid music from uh, 20 past 5 on Saturday until 6 o'clock on Sunday morning. The trouble is, though, the logistics of something like that, isn't it? You, if you're a rock fan and you want to... How, do you, how on earth do you fit 13 hours in? I think you just get a flask of tea and sit up on oh, four videos. Yeah, what time are you on, Billy? Well, I'm, I'm going to be there at the kick-off at 5 o'clock to, um, to uh, help Marshall make a tea and stuff like that, because they're uh, definitely paying me overtime to come for 13 hours. He's on all night. And, yeah, I'm there. I'm on standby all night, because I'm just a sort of first That's This has always been my trick, um, you know, because I'm nice and cheap. I ain't stepping anywhere. You know, this is how I've got on all the best tours I've ever got, because Kirsch put a word in for me, because he's still used to, used to work to, with each other. He used to be my boss. Yeah, he's he still under contract. That's Capitalist. Fitting me in. Well, not really that. It was more co wasn't it? It was. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't really. It was more sort of like workers' control, wasn't it? And of course, in the list. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We were, yeah. yeah. I remember that's coming here with you once, actually, when you made your first appearance on breakfast. That's right. right. And it's I was standing over there just in the corner. Looking shy. Tuning the guitars, yeah. But now you've got a much better haircut than I was. I was yanked off the street. Yeah. Right. <laughs> by whistle test producer Trevor Down. Thanks, Trevor. Yes. The thing is, though, when right, being Drop mates, me do, you, do you have to be polite about his music? Polite? No, I loved it. That's how, that's how uh, I know, but I mean, what if you didn't? Uh, well, I'd never rung him up in the first place yeah. and said, hey, you're all right, you know, more power to your pledge. More power to your pledge. Yeah. I think uh, well, we ought to see more of this plectrum. Because we've actually got a clip somewhere of your latest single. Yep. It's called Levi Stubbs Tears. Levi Stubbs Tears. Levi Stubbs Tears. And here's amazing. just a taster of this. Uh, 
Aha on stage in Dallas. They went over a few weeks ago and filmed Aha playing. Now, of course, you two are great Aha fans, aren't oh, you? Oh, we are. Yeah. Norwegian yeah. music, we've always been supporters of Norwegian music. Yeah. Good, I'm glad you got that clear done. Yeah. Um, so, and they thought that Aha wouldn't be able to play live, but they were nicely surprised when they got over there and they caught. So, an exclusive film of Aha playing live uh, in the studio and at the Town and Country Club in Kentish Town. There's Cameo and Boss, Echo and the Bunny Ben, Stan Ridgeway, and uh, Billy Bragg. And then you're all playing together, aren't you? Something That's right, like, yeah. Uh, calling it an all-star jam, where if you sit in a tour and watch and you're able to ring in and say, I'd like to see Billy Bragg, Echo in the Bunnymen, Stan Ridgeway and whoever else, uh, all have a go at Stay away to Evan or Jim Reeves, he'll have to go, whatever you want to name. That's and then right. they've got to frantically practice it and then try and do it later in the programme. Right, so it's BBC Two and it, it starts is. at? Uh, 5.20 5 on Saturday. 5.20 on Saturday. Yeah, Dire Straits on the Alchemy Tour as well, Rock Lookalikes Contest, uh, special documentaries on ZZ Top, The House Meltings and Genesis and all sorts. What more could anyone want? We look forward to that. Bye bye, Frank. Well, over here we are uh, gearing up for a look at the morning newspapers, and uh, a pre election tax row is brewing up. Labour will put the squeeze on high earners, warns the Times. Uh, the Paris bomb outrage is pictured in today, headlined in cold blood. The Heidi High star Barry Howard has been sacked for drinking, says the Sun. And as the Manchester Air Disaster Inquiry nears its end, more tales of heroism emerge in the Express. Our guest reviewer today is Manchester MP Alf Morris. Uh, both the airport and Willenshaw Hospital, where the injured passengers were taken, are in his constituency, and he thinks there are lessons to be learned, not just for the CAA, but for the hospital authorities too. Actually, it was an inquest rather than an inquiry, wasn't it? Uh, you're very welcome this morning. Uh, what lessons do you think we're going to learn from this? Because a lot of the things that are being talked about have been sort of talked about quite a long time. A great many very important lessons. Uh, the CAA, that's the Civil Aviation Authority, have already made 12 recommendations. They concern the number of seats on this kind of aircraft and other aircraft. Uh, the wearing of smoke holes in the case of uh, fire. And other very important recommendations about evacuation procedures. I think we should pause for a moment today to salute the two stewardesses who died at the back of the plane who died at the back of the plane and who knew their fate I mean, they knew what was happening to that aircraft and quite clearly gave their lives in the service of their passengers well they're featured on the front page of the daily express and in several other newspapers this morning i mean they got on with it they're trying to get people out and you spoke to some of the people who have got out it seems absolutely chaotic i, I visited the survivors in withenshaw hospital um, the morning after the tragedy and I remember one young woman from Lancashire telling me that all the seats collapsed forward when the plane stopped when the plane stopped and that she had, people walked over her she said and I had to walk over other passengers in order to try and get out uh, I'd have thought there's some kind of a lesson there and the fact that the hospital was ready for people with broken bones. In fact, the people who came in desperate need of medical attention um, were victims of lung uh, conditions who almost died from yeah. smoke. Anyway, the point the papers make today is that uh, Sharon Ford, age 23, and Jacqueline Obanski, age 27, did their job until they were eventually uh, they died. Uh, that's, we've been talking about social workers this morning, Alf, and uh, they're having a big conference down in Cardiff, and you've, uh, uh, you've put it here, there's a, a Guardian headline, Councils Ignore Homeless, what's the story? Um, it's really um, another very important story from Cardiff, from the conference of the directors of social services, really about the daunting strain that local authorities are under in trying to cope with all the uh, claims on their, on, on their resources. Apparently the, uh, the social services are losing track of these people when they go into bed for breakfast, as, as many people are now put in by council for bed breakfast. Yes, I think they would say that they can't do right for doing wrong. I mean, we've had this uh, week, and indeed this morning, further talk about children um, in jeopardy. And many local authorities now are taking the line, better safe than sorry. And other things can go by default. It's interesting, isn't it, that uh, I was saying earlier that social workers get a bad press, uh, and yet here, this other headline in the, uh, the Guardian, City Aid Social Workers at Risk, uh, one of them was killed going about his duty. I'm oh, sorry, a lady, Miss uh, Francis Etridge, and they're going along in pairs. They do have a very difficult job. Yeah, and sometimes 
you know, social workers are used as scapegoats, and people avoid their collective responsibility for the misery and violence that exists in our society at the present time. We have to address ourselves much more to the causes of social problems, and as I say, of violence. Alf, what do you make, let's, let's switch the subject now, what do you make of this headline of the Daily Mail that we pictured out of the Times? We'd all have to pay more. When you come to power, you're all going to squeeze us dry until the, the, the pips run out. Is that, is that the idea? That your, your tax plans, the SDLP too, have been criticised by the Tories, and it's obviously going to be a big election argument uh, about the tax you are taking. Well, like the Daily Express this morning, I mean, they talk about ruination in the future. The Financial Times, by contrast, and The Guardian, talk about what's happening now. I mean, look at the front page of the Financial Times. It talks of the pound reaching a record low. And incidentally, the last record low in early 1985 produced a four percentage point increase in interest rates. So is relieving people of more tax going to solve that problem? Well, um, I, I would say to, the, to, to both papers that Robin Hood got a much better press than Mr Bumble uh, when it came to... Um, look, I, I would say it does. If you have a fairer society, you have a stronger economy. But uh, as the mail puts it, uh, Chancellor Nigel Lawson, Lawson warned that under Labour everyone would pay more than the socialist plan to soak the rich. I mean, it's, uh, uh, the Tory words are there and the Daily Mail's words are there, aren't they? Is that going to happen? I mean, are we all going to have to pay a great deal more tax to avoid low pounds and uh, unemployment? That's a classic way of diverting attention from what's happening now, talking about doom in the future. I mean, yesterday we had record unemployment figures, leaving out 113,000 young people who left school in the summer. I'd much rather talk, realistically, about solving the problems we have. Um, that, in my view, is just throwing dust in people's eyes. Well, Alf, that's all we have time for at the moment. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, when do you go back to work? Well, we're working now, officially, next month. I knew you'd say that. You're very welcome. Thanks a lot. Coming up soon on Breakfast Time, Shanghai Surprise. The new Madonna movie, The Punters Say, lacks Eastern Promise. But first, here's a look at what's on breakfast time next week. On breakfast time next week, rocking his way out of the 70s, wild man Alice Cooper. Anatoly Sharansky, the free dissident, talks about life in the West. Franco Zeffirelli takes us from Romeo and Juliet to the opera Otello. Plus, all the latest news and comment from the Liberal Party Conference. That's on breakfast time next week from 10 to 7. Now today in New York, the long-awaited film Shanghai Surprise opens, starring the husband and wife team of Madonna and Sean Penn. But the film, unlike its often colourful stars, has not gone, gone down so well with the critics, as Tom Brook now reports from New York. That report just coming up soon. The new film, Madonna and Sean Penn, Shanghai Surprise. Does it like Eastern Promise? What is all this fuss about Madonna? I, I, I don't know. Isn't this, she's not wearing all those kind of bras I outside her front. I don't think she sure. is, but I think we're just gonna we're just gonna find out all about this new film. I think she's a missionary in this new film. Yeah, she's nobody seems to have heard about it. That's the trouble. <laughs> In what has to be one of the most improbable bits of casting ever, Madonna, in Shanghai Surprise, plays a part of a missionary. The film is billed as a romantic adventure comedy, set in the Far East during the 1930s. Madonna's real-life husband, actor Sean Penn, plays a part of a fortune hunter.
sparks to fly, certainly. They certainly fly when these two are walking the street and they confront a paparazzi. So why don't they, you know, what happened here? It's, it's just it's truly astounding. Have you ever wondered what might happen if we'd met someplace else? Bar at the Coconut Grove or... Oh, make it a church picnic you can set. <laughs> You've never been to a church picnic in your life. What's also remarkable is how little publicity there's been for the film. Normally, a picture of this kind is heavily promoted on television and in magazines. And here, outside the cinema, where later today Shanghai Surprise will open, hardly anyone seems to know anything at all about it. What's the name of it again? Shanghai Surprise. Shanghai Surprise. I'm going to check it out. Well, what do you know about the film? Uh, actually, not too much. To tell you the truth, really, not much at all. Have you heard anything about the film? Not really too much, just I know that Madonna will be in it, and I'm really interested in seeing how she performs. Madonna's name will no doubt draw in the crowds, initially at any rate in New York, and so will a musical score by George Harrison. But other than that, in America, Shanghai Surprise appears to be going down as a highly forgettable film.
I'm Michael Chinnery and Michael's come in today. We've been taking phone calls through the morning on people who've got all sorts of kind of things. Well, they think eating their garden, I suspect not always the case. Things that go squelch in the night. So should we get on to our, our first phone call then? The first one's from Marion Meachin, for calling from Southampton this morning. Good morning, Marion. Good morning. What's your question? I have dung beetles in my garden which are infesting my lawn and I'd like to know whether they're good or bad. But in any case, I'd like to get rid of them, please. You can always rely on somebody to lower the tone of the conversation. And it's usually you. Started. It's usually me. I'm glad it's somebody else's fault. Dung beetles, Michael. Yes, Mrs. Meachin, it sounds as if you have a rather inconsiderate dog, or perhaps your neighbour has an inconsiderate dog. Uh, I've never really heard of many dung beetles in people's gardens, but as you've got them, uh, they're certainly not bad, and if you've got dung as well, they're jolly good, because what? dung beetles basically bury the dung and get rid of it. What they look like? They're about an inch long, uh, very, very blue-black, uh, about half an inch wide, and pretty high, sort of, by the time they're on their legs, I suppose, about half an inch high, and they scoot along. Right. My main worry at the moment is my little grandson has seen them, and he picks them up and, what's this, you know? <laughs> Have you actually got dung on the lawn? Have you got an inconsiderate dog? I have a dog, yes, and um, we do, as probably most dog owners <laughs> do, try and sort of scoot out after him as quickly as possible. Mm. But uh, it's amazing how quickly these dung beetles appear, almost within minutes of the dog being out in the garden. And when I say I've got a lot, I literally mean dozens. Marion, Marion, I've got a dog as well, and if you could send me a matchbox full of dung beetles, um, I'd be very grateful. Need I say more? All right, so it sounds as though they're, they're not really, Michael, any danger to you. They do if, a good job. If they're dung beetles, they're not doing any harm at all. And if they're not dung beetles, they're probably not doing any harm either. Right, OK. Can we, can we move on now? Thanks a lot, Marion. That's Thank great. You, um, lots of questions this morning on ants. I always get lots of questions on ants. Mrs Lincoln of Romford, Christopher Jenkins, age 12, of Merthyr Tidfield. Good morning, Christopher. Moynis Nelson of Wye, Dorothy Walker of Pinkney, and Mrs Howard of Huddersfield. I've got ants of varying colours. They're worried about them in the garden. Now, I gather from your book that different coloured ants, some are goodies, some are baddies. I think, basically, all ants are a little bit better than they are bad ants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they milk green fly like cows. Oh, they milk green fly, but they, they herd and farm green fly, which we often call the, the ants' cows. They take the, the honeydew from them, the nice sweet liquid from, liquid from the backside. But um, that's not the only thing they do. Ants are pretty well omnivorous creatures. They'll eat seeds, they'll eat caterpillars, they'll eat maggots, all sorts of nasty creeping crawlies in the garden as well. So they do a good job? They can do a good job. When they really become a nuisance is when they get under your plants and install those aphids on the roots of the plants. So aphids are sucking the sap away and your poor plants will flop down and look a bit sickly. And sometimes in very dry weather the ants in fact will nibble some roots to get moisture. So that's when they're doing harm. But normally I would say don't worry about the ants. So we've, this is a balance we've got to strike, is it? No insect is all good all the time and all bad all the time. Do you mm. find it hard to understand when someone like me says, ugh, creepy crawlies? Because you seem to really love them. I do, yes. Um, well, everybody has their own taste. Um, no accounting, but is it? <laughs> Shall we go? We've got, I think, Kay Stutchbury of Dunstable on the phone. Right, see if she's there. Kay. Hello, Kay. Hello, good morning. Good morning. What's good your morning. question? Can you tell me what we should do about loads of hoverflies in our conservatory? Are they eating the glass and the wood? Is this, is, is this the problem, Kay? Are they nibbling it? No, no. <laughs> no, it isn't a wooden one. It's an aluminium, a new aluminium They'll have to have pretty strong mandibles to get into that. Are they just, they're just a bit of a nuisance to you, then? Yes, yes. We can't really sit out there. Michael. We, we them all first. Oh, well, it sounds to me uh, as if your conservatory is more of a danger to the hoverflies. They do at this time of year, of course, get trapped in conservatories and greenhouses in very large numbers. Uh, I don't think you need worry about them at all. They might settle on your nose and tickle it, of course, but they are very useful insects in that they pollinate a lot of your crops. If you're growing things like tomatoes oh, and some of the other plants yeah, in your conservatory, yeah, well, they're. Fuchsias. Are they any harm to fuchsias? No, hoverflies won't do any harm at all. The actual flies themselves will help to pollinate your plants, and in fact, their their grubs, if they're the sorts of hoverflies I think they are, their grubs will actually eat a lot of the aphids, assuming you have some of those in your conservatory. Most people do. Yeah. So they are very useful creatures, and right. I suggest you just try and get them okay. out. Thanks, Kate. You've got to All live right, with Kate. them. They're doing good for your tomatoes. Right. Yeah. All right. Bye bye then. All right. We've got a um, couple of quickies, really. Brenda Beelier of East Finchley has a colony of lizards in the garden. Briefly, oh, she says, are they a danger? Not 
at all, no. Um, lizards are, are declining quite uh, dramatically in a lot of parts of the country. So encourage them because they'll eat up now. Encourage them, they'll eat the slugs, yes. Great, right. Well, we've discovered this morning, at least I've discovered, a lot of the things in that book that I thought were really quite nasty are quite nice for me, garden. I should be encouraging you, so hope you will as well. So now you don't mind you, you poison yours with that uh, with guineas, don't you? No, I give Your them slugs. slugs, it's a lovely way to go. Yeah, they go, hey, splash. <laughs> well, talking of bugs and things like that, here's Francis. No bugs in the system this morning, I hope, cross fingers. Um, it's the southern half of Britain this weekend that's going to see the good cheerful sunshine, particularly the south of Wales and England. Further north, things are a problem. Take a look from satellite at how things have developed during the night. You see an interesting jet stream pushing right across the Atlantic, about 150 mile an hour in there. Between Iceland and Scotland, a lot of weather. It's encouraged by an old hurricane, Hurricane Earl, that's come off the States, and it's taking that kind of track during the weekend. On the periphery of it, you can just see that cloud flirting with the north of Scotland. It's bringing some rain, in fact, now, into the Western Isles here. But for the rest of us, you can see a glorious start to the day, obviously low temperatures with all that to clear sky during the night. But it's the behavior of this veil of cloud. The predictive sequence, in fact, shows that during the morning, most of us are going to see fairly cheerful, bright sunshine. Now, by midday, it's the bright band over the north of Scotland, the far north of Scotland, that will have the heavy rain. During the afternoon, that'll continue its uh, way southwards to Glasgow and Edinburgh, and during tomorrow, it'll be begin to cover more and more of the northern half of Britain. The other satellite pass that's of interest this morning was taken from a low-flying satellite, and you can see the extent of the clear skies that have been overnight, so you wouldn't be surprised at low temperatures. This morning's weather map looks like this. In fact, this morning, the uh, Mull of Galloway got down to 10 on the coast, but just a few miles down the road at West Froome, minus one in the valley, the different microclimates. This afternoon, the veil of cloud comes down. The winds at midday will be quite light, but gales off the northwest coast of Scotland. The temperatures back to the 60s, almost autumn again. The summary chart for today, there you are. Coming up, Himalayas by canoe and living to tell the tale, and the Alps by elephant. Hannibal Botham on a trek for charity. Nine o'clock is the time. It's Friday the 19th of September. A very good morning to you for breakfast time. Sue Carpenter's here with the news. Good morning. The Americans and the Russians are holding top-level talks today to try to find a way out of the diplomatic maze that has grown up around the case of Nicholas Denilov. The Soviet Foreign Minister, Edward Shevardnadze, will hear renewed demands to drop spy charges against the American journalist when he meets his American counterpart, George Shultz, in Washington. The two men will also be trying to rescue plans for a summit meeting between President Reagan and Mr. Gorbachev. From Washington, Martin Bell. The talks start early and last for two days, but with very different perceptions of what the agenda should be. From the American point of view, the Danilov case is at the top of it. To the Russians, that's just a routine irritant in superpower relations. Such incidents have happened before. And uh, may happen in the future in the relations between states. This is undesirable, but unfortunately it does happen. But the Americans are not conciliatory. National Security Advisor John Poindexter on the expelled Soviet diplomats. The whole point of the message in the UN is that the United States is no longer going to tolerate uh, espionage being conducted out of the United Nations, out of the missions there, with impunity. Officials at the State Department do not expect the meetings here to produce a date for another summit. They do expect them to show whether one is possible. The French government and an Arab terrorist group have both threatened to inflict vengeance on each other after the latest violence in Paris and Beirut. A promise by the French Prime Minister Jacques Chirac to respond to the bombings with crushing, pitiless action is interpreted as using hit squads or even bombing raids into Lebanon. A group called the Anti-Imperialist International Brigade replied by saying it shot the French military attaché Christian Goutier in Beirut and would kill more French diplomats. Rival groups say they carried out the Paris bombing in which five people died. All share a common purpose, to protest at French policy towards the Arabs and free Arab prisoners. The French establishment has been shocked by the deaths. The government is worried by the threat to its authority and has promised to fight terrorism to the finish. 
This has led to the high-profile security measures such as the patrols of the riot police on the Champs-Élysées and other major public places. The government is trying to live down the embarrassment of advertising a million franc reward for two Arabs who turned up at their home in Lebanon. Here at home, more than 70 people were arrested last night when police raided a pub in Gillingham in Kent. 130 officers, led by members of the drug squad, moved in on the monarch an hour before closing time. The police say they removed some substances for examination. Andrew Taylor reports. The monarch pub had been under police surveillance for some time. Last night's raid came at about 9.30, an hour or so before closing time. The raid itself was over in a few minutes. 130 police, some of them with specially trained sniffer dogs. But the searches went on for several hours. Around the pub, roads have been closed off. More than 70 people were arrested, though most of them have now been allowed to go home. The police have brought in special vans in which to search and question them on the spot. Well, I marched the cell, hands beyond the back, hands beyond the head, and I, I took a cell. And I took us into the vans, strip searched us. I just stripped down, totally naked, into the vans. And that took about two and a half hours. It's not known yet what drugs or what quantities were seized, but the operation is part of a crackdown Kent police have been warning of for some time on the peddling of heroin and cocaine in the county. Contractors employed by Nirex, the nuclear waste agency, managed this morning to get onto the site at Killingholm in South Humberside, designated as a possible dumping site. Previous attempts to start test drilling had been prevented by local demonstrators. Meanwhile, protesters at Fulbeck in Lincolnshire, who chained themselves to barriers outside their site yesterday evening, are continuing their vigil. And that's it. I'll be back with the news headlines at the end of the programme. Let's over to Frank. Well, with me now are two of the bravest, or you might say foolhardiest, men you're ever likely to meet. They are Mark Attenborough and Philip Hunter, just back from a gruelling two-and-a-half-month expedition, canoeing the turbulent white waters of the Himalayas. Mark and Philip are by no means new to danger. Last year they made a similar exhibition, ex expedition to Lapland, and there they navigated stretches of water rather like these, where the canoes were li liable to be snatched up, thrown around, tossed into the air, to land face down in the river. Incidentally, that film has just won BBC's prestigious Mike Burke Award. Well, Mark Amber and Philip are here. Very good morning to you. Um, how high did you start? You took all the gear up, did you? And uh, you started going down three separate rivers. Yes, we had. Uh, we went up by jeep um, on two of the rivers, and we actually hired porters to get up on the third river, the Hispal. Uh, the height when you started? They varied because we did three rivers. The first one was about seven and a half thousand. The second river did started at about nine. And Nangapar Bat, which is the world's eighth highest mountain, that started at about eleven thousand feet. And none of these rivers had been navigated before, is that right? No, they're all first, first of Britain. That's why we went out there to do them. Lovely. Now you've got some pictures, and I want you to tell us what's going on here because I haven't seen these either. So uh, is that somewhere near the top? Is it? That looks a very, very small river indeed, or is it a very high, it's, a very high position? In fact, that's on the Karakoram Highway going up. The Karakoram Highway um, is a fantastic road, and um, they lost about a thousand Chinese and Pakistan workforce building it. And uh, that's one of the views just going up. That's before you get to the dangerous bits. I see. That, that, that's the, view uh, out the first of the river, isn't it? Yeah. And what's this one coming up now? Uh, this Friday. is very big water. The first river we did was the Gilgit River. And uh, there's some very big water conditions, as you can see. And we were getting buried a lot of the time. We had quite a few frights in that session. And uh, did you do any wrecking at all? I mean, when you went around a corner, did you know what was going to be like? Uh, no, because of first descents, um, we didn't know at all. That's why we had Phil and the backup team to help us. Any nasty moments? There must have been. Yes, there were several on Pandora to fill it because in line with that photograph you've just seen, shortly after that was taken, Phil had a very nasty Tell me. I think there were nasty moments um, all the time because obviously, as you say, it hadn't been wrecked, so you didn't know what was around the corner, and very often you'd speed around the corner because the river was flowing very fast, and there'd be problems right in front of you, and you just got to keep moving, you don't have time to think about it. You were thrown around a lot? Um, well, all the canoes were thrown around a lot, but I think um, from the support point of view, one of our worst moments was whilst they were canoeing the Gilgit River. We were wrecking ahead with the jeep, and um, it started to rain, a real torrential downpour, monsoon type rain, and um, we were sitting in the back of the open jeep and getting rather damp at the time. Well, let's have a flavour of that Lapland uh, journey again, because that gives us some idea of what it was like. It's not where you've been, but it's where you have been in, uh, on a previous visit. And I I'm, I'm wonder how the canoe stood up. I mean, this is a, a fairly standard canoe you're using, isn't it? Is it uh, a good, solid British canoe? Did they smash up, crack up at all? It certainly is British, um, and it's made of plastic. Basically, you could drive an artic articulated lorry over it, 
and uh, the canoe would be perfectly okay. You see her under, right under here. And they uh, have to take a lot of hammer. Um, yeah. I mean, this was nothing compared to what we met in the Himalayas. It's much worse than that. Much worse than that. Tell me, why did you do it? It sounds a sort of foolhardy, I was saying in the introduction, possibly an uh, idea. I think everybody does it for their own personal reasons. Um, it does seem foolhardy. I think probably we all thought it was foolhardy whilst we were actually doing it. Uh, but it was fun planning it, and it's fun now being back. But I think we all do it for a sense of achievement. Uh, have you got a good record brought back? Because we, we we're going to have a look at some more of your, your snaps now, as it were. And uh, you, what, film, did you? Or, or? Uh, we, we took a lot of slides. Yeah. We took about 3,600 slides. That's winching it up, presumably. No, that's way. crossing. Um, to get up the Hispar, we canoe down a river that flows down the northern uh, watershed of Rakaposhi, which is known as the Goddess of the Snows. And to get up there, we had tremendous problems just getting the boats to the top where we could start. It looks pretty evil water, that. Yeah, well, this is crossing the river itself. Um, with all the equipment and get the porters across to walk up the footpath which crossed at this point. Okay, let's flip over to another one. Oh my god. You went through that, did you? Are you somebody going through that or yes, buried or what? Somebody in the middle of that picture. That's right, they're heading away in yellow. That was the problems of support. I mean often we would be on the water like that and Phil would have the um, only just task of trying to keep with us and make sure that we were safe by basically protecting us downstream with ropes. So weren't you, weren't you fearsome of rocks? They, they, are, they are must be a great danger. Yes, um, th there were a lot of frightening moments. I mean, to go to the Himalayas it is an ultimate challenge and um, that's why we went there basically. Um, we've done the previous expeditions and this was something to top the lot. Yeah. But as we look at the final picture, I mean, when you go down and you've cracked it and, and you've gone through a particularly nasty bit, the adrenaline, the thrill must be fantastic. It's the reward at the end, yes, the feel that you've done it. I mean, here, the sort of problems we had, we had to open up the road a few times, the jeep tracks. Yeah. This was after a landslide which happened almost in front of us. And we physically had to clear the road before we could get back down the valley. What's that? That's off Nanga Parbat. Um, all night long we could hear cracks um, when we were up at the base camp. That's an avalanche. And that's an avalanche right? coming down through one of the gullies. Yeah. It gives some sort of scale of that. That's probably about uh, 300 feet high and about half a mile across. Absolutely fantastic. Okay, in a word, why did you do it? Um, challenge. Just that. Just the challenge and the experience of, of going there and doing it, coming back richer people. What do you do next? Um, I don't know, I've got all sorts of things. I'm dancing because my wife is so uh, rich. <laughs> She's hoping to keep you at home for a while. She wants me at home next year, definitely. Thank, Thank you very much for coming. Again. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Tales of more adventures on this side of the studio because this weekend, sportsman Ian Botham will be grabbing the headlines again. Not on the cricket pitch, but on an elephant. On Sunday in the Channel Islands, he plans to give a preview of his latest and most extravagant charity fundraising scheme. Last year, Botham raised thousands of pounds for leukaemia research by walking from John O'Groats to Land's End. Now, with a few elephants, he plans a sponsored walk over the Alps, following in the footsteps of that famous historical character, Hannibal. And in Jersey on Sunday, Botham will get in some early training. As Bob Whitaker discovered, he certainly needs it. Enter a rather large new television star, Lola. Only five, but already she's a ton and a quarter. Oh, you yeah, great thing. Here comes another, more established star of ample proportions, Ian Botham. He may be giving the heave ho to Somerset, but surely he can't be running away to join a circus. Right. <sighs> Whoa. The big fella does look a bit stumped aboard Lola. Still, he's got 17 months to get his act together before the Botham army heads across the Alps to retrace the steps of another larger-than-life character, Hannibal. In 219 BC, Hannibal took 60,000 troops and 40 elephants on the epic journey to knock the Romans for six. This modern-day legend has less warlike ambitions. He's just taking a few friends and four elephants. The mission? To raise one million pounds for his favorite charity, Leukemia Research. It was an amazing feat, and uh, I think that you know, just to try and do it um, would be an achievement to, uh, to follow the man. But when you think when he did it, all those centuries ago, uh, and fought about half a dozen battles on the way, absolutely amazing. So I think it'll draw a lot of interest, and that's obviously a good way of getting more money for the Leukemia Fund. <laughs> 
cricketer is well trodden in the art of long charity marches. Last November, with three pals, he trekked 900 miles from John O'Groats to Land's End, eventually raising £800,000 for leukaemia. That same team will take on the more ambitious Alps adventure. One of them, Phil Rance, whose father died of leukaemia, is organising the journey. Of course, where Botham goes, so does his minder, Andy Withers, just to keep him from falling off Mont Blanc. Andy, you looked after Ian during the leukaemia walk from John O'Groats to Land's End. How do you think he's going to cope with the Alps? Well, I don't think he'll, he'll worry too much about it. You know, I mean, obviously the worst thing is going to be the cold, but um, we're following in four-wheel drive vehicles, so we'll have plenty of warm clothing, hot drinks, this sort of thing, bags of long johns, thermal underwear sort of thing, you know. But uh, I think it'll be right, as long as we keep moving. And we're not actually staying in a tent on top of the Alps each night. We're going to be shifting back to a hotel. So I should imagine it'll be right. It'll be February 1988 when Botham's troops head off on Hannibal's historic 1,000-mile journey. Starting from Cartagena in southern Spain, meandering up the coast through Barcelona into the swirling heights of the Pyrenees, then sliding down onto the desolate French plains of the Camargue. A little climb up again into the high Alps. And finally, eight weeks later, a gentle limp down to Italy and Turin. It's so vast, the project. I mean, it's probably the biggest single charity undertaking ever made. So really, it's a vastness that is difficult to comprehend at this stage, really. That's how big the project is. Why did you personally decide you wanted to undertake such a big project? Uh, excluding madness. It, it's it's just so appealing the whole thing. I mean, <clears throat> the, the idea was born through Ian, of course, as, as part of his crusade against leukemia. And I just quite simply started reading the Hannibal books. I mean, we toyed with the idea initially of perhaps doing half of the route and things of this nature. But once you read the book, you've got to do the whole thing. You know, it, it would be sacrilege not to do the whole thing. It's just a marvellous story. Oh, let's turn left. Left. This modern day Hannibal, though, looks a bit short on riding practice, but Ian will get that on Sunday when Lola and the gang join him for a 30 mile trot around Jersey to do some fundraising. That'll be a doddle, of course, but will he really make it across the Alps? Now, you do have to ask me that question. Now, be serious. You did the last one. Are you actually having to consider whether I'll do it or not? Of course I'll do it. <laughs> well, it looks like Lola wants to go over here, so I'll see you later. <laughs> Knowing him, he'll end up giving an elephant to piggyback, I think. It was Bob Whitaker reporting there. And on breakfast time on Monday, we'll have a special report on what the Channel Islanders make of Hannibal Botham. Over here, Kelly Monty and me have been talking about the things that young men do. I mean, they're, they're, you know, they they want to do that. There's both of them doing that. So those marvellous canoeists. So. But you said you did a barb. Well, I'd love to do a barb slam. Well, I'd love to go on a barb slam. Yes, I, I um, it, all of the purpose of filming, of course, I, I was put on the back of a, a two-man bob in mm -hmm. some artist band called Nino Bibbia, who was a great Swiss champion. And was asked on a radio mic to talk my way down. And I remember he said, uh, "What? Because I have to break. You see, if you're a yeah. two man, the, the second man breaks." And what do you mean, Bibio said? When I say pull, oh, just God. ease gently on the sticks, and then the teeth uh, dig into the, the slope, and you grab. And of course, we went down this slope. It was ferociously fast. And I could see this great ball coming up and turning to the right. But when he said, "Pull," I would pull like that. <laughs> and I was being sure to pull. But well, how fast do you, how, what kind of speeds do you get up to? Difficult to say. It just seems very, very quick. Because the noise is just immense. It's terribly really? noisy. Well, they're ice wall. Yeah. Oh, that's supposed to be the guest here. Talk to me. <laughs> ah, have you ever, ever any great desire to do something like well, that? Well, I want to turn my electric blanket down to media. <laughs> <laughs> just for the thrill of it. Yes, yeah. and uh, that was enough for me. I put it right back up and went back to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. What about our friends over there?
especially Brave. No, no. The greatest tribute we ever saw to Bravery was after we'd done a gig in Inverness one night. We got thrown out to the hotel after the gig by a man who had killed us and all the guitars he thought were hooligans. So we wondered where we were going to spend the evening. But we went in the car and we drove up to Culloden Moor where the battle was. And it was like really eerie. There was a moon and a bit of mist. And all, we drank at the top of we, and, and all over the, uh, the moor there were these little bumps and written on them was things like uh, the men of Clan Chatton for you know, 800 killed. We were going along with the torch like that. There's a real big one over here. And they come across here, see what this one was. Put the light on it and it said, in memory of Wretch, Grinstead Touring Caravan as a source in 1970. Oh, the thrill of actually forming a career is, is enough in itself because, in fact, you had quite a late start. It was 30 before anyone had any notice of you at all, and that must have been a kind of struggling challenge. Oh, it doesn't yeah. have to be physical or awkward. No, that's true. Because I've had many a rebuff, I'm sure. Oh, definitely. I sort of look 